Hi, and welcome to the History Hut. Uh, this is the final section of our discussion of Islam. I'm Jim. This is Dr. K. And uh, as we've been discussing uh, Islam, it's been, uh, we've been talking about all, all different aspects uh, of the religion. What's the, the cultural legacy of Islam? Uh, there's an amazing cultural legacy. Probably the, the greatest legacy is in terms of architecture, and that would be with the uh, the mosque. And um, I, I was saying to you earlier off camera, uh, probably the best thing to do is uh, for people to just uh, Google images of some of the, the key mosques, the Umayyad Product mosque, placement. <laughs> the Umayyad mosque in uh, Damascus, the incredible Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem, the Al Azhar Mosque and University Complex in Cairo, uh, the Blue Mosque in Istanbul fabulous um, the great mosque in Cordoba and if you want to look at a different kind of design for the mosque then uh, the mosque of Selim in Edirne in Turkey or uh, look at some of the mosques in Africa in West Africa and places like Mali absolutely distinctive African design for uh, for the mosques there and the, uh, the architecture changes depending on uh, it does the, the depending region. on the local region so when you look in, in uh, uh, say Uzbekistan it's different compared to the Arab world compared to to North Africa. Uh, Spain is probably very much Al Andalusia, very much uh, the same as the the Arab, the rest of the Arabic world. But um, uh, places like uh, you know Cordoba, Toledo, uh, Granada, spectacular examples of the of um, mosques there. So if you can't actually get into the Islamic world, if you can't get to um, to you know Turkey or Lebanon or Syria, uh, just go to Spain because you can see great examples uh, there as well. The mosques are um, a great design, uh, of course, on the outside, but uh, on the inside as well. Um, there's there are no unlike you know Christian churches, uh, there are no um, religious images or icons or paintings. Just the carpets on the floor, lighting inside, uh, lots and lots of space, beautiful domes, lots of tile work, uh, abstract uh, art and floral patterns rather than any direct representations of uh, Allah or the uh, or the Prophet Muhammad. Um, and there are other, of course, uh, not only do you have the mosques and the, the fountains that usually go with the mosques as well, but there's there are more things. The, the miniature painting in the Islamic world is really uh, quite spectacular. Uh, glass lamps, uh, carpet work, uh, marble stone work, and the, uh, always the use of the color blue. Uh, green's quite uh, quite popular as well. Uh, and in terms of, um, of other things, uh, things other than architecture, literature Your as well. Your favorite? Uh, yeah, well, it actually is my favorite because if you travel a lot then uh, that's of course the the kind of uh, first thing that you see uh, that has to do with the Islamic world uh, but in terms of literature before the Prophet there's an established tradition of poetry in Arabia passed on as you would expect through the oral tradition uh, lots of it is uh, gathered in the ninth century and put on paper that's the historian's job you know um, lots of it about uh, wine women and camels in the West it's usually wine women and song in the East um, wine women and camels you know the ode to a camel Camel, uh, and the camels sometimes sound like beautiful women. It's, For me, it's, it's, like, it's, you know, it's beer, fun. ladies, and sports. Oh, well, yeah. we'll that's see. the maybe yeah, the Canadian. The, that, that's <laughs> that, sure, yeah, the Canadian one. <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> no camels in there at no, all. No, oh, don't have room. Gee. Well, <laughs> So if you have were, a car, if you were from Persia, then uh, you would write, you would see things written more about kings and folk tales, and that's collected in a thing called the, the collection called the Book of Lords. After the seventh century, the Quran is the most important of uh, you know absolutely central, but uh, poetics continue, and the best known in the West is uh, the the uh, the poems of Omar Khayyam, who is a, a court mathematician and poet and his most famous piece in the West is the Rubiat. Uh, there are also some absolutely wonderful um, Sufi poets and Sufi is a kind of mystical tradition in Islam and one of the best is uh, a guy called Rumi, a Sufi mystic born in 1207 in Mazar al-Sharif or really close to it and then pushed out of that area with his family by the arrival of the Mongols and so he ends up getting kind of pushed to Samarkand and then uh, where does it go? Damascus and then he ends up in Konya in Turkey and he writes some uh, absolutely beautiful poems about uh, about love and uh, not when his love poems are, are really about about his love for 
Allah. Really wonderful. Here's one. Uh, this is just part of, of one poem. Uh, no one looks for stars when the sun's out. A person blended into God does not disappear. He or she is just completely soaked in God's qualities. Do you need a quote from the Quran? There you go. And that's from a book called Rumi, The Book of Love, Poems of Ecstasy and Longing. And there's lots of other uh, really good examples from Rumi. Now, the other thing that happens is, in terms of literature, is historical writing. And the, the guy to um, go to here is a, a man called Al Masudi. And Al Masudi's book is called Meadows of Gold, published uh, about 957, so middle of the 10th century. And uh, this is where we get our knowledge of the Abbasid dynasty because he more or less writes a history that goes all the way from Adam and Eve up to the time that he's living in. So you all sorts of uh, really interesting insights into life in the Abbasid uh, dynasty and before that. Another great writer is Ibn Khaldun who tried to talk about uh, the philosophy of history. You know, near and dear to our hearts as historians. <laughs> and of course, incredible amounts of travelers' tales, uh, people like Ibn Battuta leaving us probably the best uh, knowledge that we have of medieval uh, places like medieval Africa, uh, medieval India, the Middle East. So, really, quite an amazing. Uh, and, and it's because, you know, to, to, uh, um, to read the Quran, you have to be literate. So literacy is vitally important. It's a really big part of, of uh, people who follow that particular faith. So very, very interesting. So obviously you don't bring me on all the trips you go on where you see all these nice places. So no. I might have to, I might have Why to do that I? myself. But yeah, uh, well, well, we're, we're we'll Islamic. Location, <laughs> we'll go on a field location, trip. Location, yeah, location, location. We'll uh, were Islamic thinkers interested in more than just architecture? Oh, of course they were. Uh, they're absolutely fascinated by astronomy. And remember when we talked about China, that was a really big, big thing as well. Uh, we talked uh, earlier on in one of our other episodes about the calendar and they follow the lunar calendar. So astronomy is a, a major concern because each month begins with the first sighting of the crescent moon. Right. So you have to be able to you know, look up at the night sky. Europeans in the even in the 15th century relied on uh, Muslim sources. And so did Copernicus, who referred to the Muslim, uh, the 11th century Muslim uh, astronomer Al-Batani. So even when we come to the beginnings of the scientific revolution in the West, they're making use of um, work from the Islamic world. Uh, from Toledo for uh, Toledo in Spain uh, for about 300 years, Toledo was the center of astronomy. They observed the, the sky uh, nightly and daily, of course, and produced information on longitude and latitude. In the West, uh, we don't work out how to, um, how to judge longitude until the 17th century. So you've got, you know, another, again, years and years, well, what, 700 years uh, mm -hmm. at least ahead. Um, and it's uh, uh, Islamic advances in uh, trigonometry that provides the tools really for the uh, for Western astronomy and the, the, the you know, Kepler and Copernicus and, and Galileo. So one of the key guys is, uh, as I said, Al-Batani, born in 858. He wrote the thing called the Sabian Tables, and these are influential for uh, centuries. They included uh, the timing of the new moon, calculating the length of the solar year, uh, predicting eclipses, studying things like parallax, which isn't understood in the West until the time of René Descartes. I still and, don't uh, understand uh, it. Well, I know, yeah. you probably don't. I'll explain it to you uh, later on. Once we get out the history hut, right. I'll show you how it works. We'll, we'll pick a bush and I'll show you. I'll show you how to find the parallax. Um, so uh, he made ma major alterations as well to um, Ptolemy's theories, especially, especially about the solar apogee, the position of the sun amongst the stars at its greatest distance from the Earth. And Ptolemy said that this was 65 degrees, and Batani found that it was uh, closer to 82 degrees, and that was just too much of a, ch of, of a difference to be uh, an inaccuracy. So they knew that, you know, that he'd got it wrong. Uh, today we know it because uh, we know it's because the solar system is actually moving through space. But of course, at the time, people believed that the sun, uh, the, sorry, the Earth was at the center of the universe and it didn't move. So they they couldn't make that kind of same leap that that we can make. They couldn't come to that conclusion at all. Uh, another great astronomer is uh, Al Biruni, born in 973. He calculated the Earth's circumference and got it so close you wouldn't even notice the difference. Um, he scientifically fixed the direction of Mecca from any point in the globe, which of course would be useful to uh, Islamic people. Right. And he said that the earth rotated r around its own axis. 
Uh, have you heard the word polymath? No, it just means that these guys are kind of polymaths. Not only are they spectacular astronomers, but they're usually uh, geographers and they write and they do, you know, like about 12 other things. So mm. a lot of them are called polymaths. Um, they were uh, they were the first to study the stars on a large scale at first without any instruments and then but with observatories and then later of course they they built instruments for the observatories and they needed patrons to do this all this stuff costs money and the caliph al mamun who is from the early 9th century 813 on uh, he was one of these patrons and so he's uh, responsible for uh, at least getting the cash together for, if not developing this himself, uh, doing things like using fixed locations for observatories, uh, having large fixed instruments for them to use, um, using scientific staff, so getting all the astronomers together and plonking them all in one observatory, and then uh, having developing kind of actual programs of work so you're not just kind of going, oh, look, uh, this guy <laughs> looks good today. Uh, and this resulted... Um, Oh yeah, well, I guess it, it, it results eventually in the production of things called star tables, ZIJ, Z-I-J. And uh, the earliest observatories uh, were at Baghdad, and so they would make up these astronomical tables and uh, solar and lunar tables and, and this ZIJ, the, the star catalogues. Uh, there are other observatories as well, uh, the Maraga Observatory in Iran in the early 13th century, and uh, that's near uh, Tabriz, and they produced new updated astronomical tables, and uh, they had an observatory library with over 40,000 books in it. So really, really serious about this stuff. And the work there is uh, credited with discovering the true cause of the rainbow. And of course, again, we don't have any real answers to you know what is a rainbow and how do how do we get one until we get to the time of Rene Descartes and the uh, the European Enlightenment. Uh, one of the astronomers um, in uh, at this particular observatory was sent to China to erect uh, a, an instrument uh, to be put on the Great Wall to star watch from there as well. So there is that connection. We know that the Chinese were really interested in this stuff already. And then uh, the observatory in Samarkand in the 15th century became the model for all of the future ones. A huge building and it, they have a, it has a meridian of ma uh, masonry and a trench about two meters wide and then they put the instrument in the that and the radius of the instrument because I know you know all these words you know because we, we love math the radius of, of this meridian arc was something like si uh, 60 50 or 60 meters high just oh, absolutely wow. uh, huge and I've, I've actually seen um, something kind of similar to that in uh, Jaipur because of course the reason that they're good at astronomy is because they they travel to India and uh, they there's um, quite a bit of uh, you know exchange of information between uh, the people, uh, the scientists in India and the scientists in the Islamic world, they actually use uh, star tables from uh, Hindu star tables. Hmm. So very, very interesting. So uh, we'll be back to talk about some of the other major works from around the Islamic world.